If you remember last week, um, we were studying um, something called uh, uh, the idea of what it is when uh, I wrote a, a song for my wife. So Randy's going to sing Hey Dude tonight. Hey Dude. Hey dude. <laughs> we'll have a solo tonight. Uh, also, so we, we how about so low we can't hear it? Right. <laughs> so low. Okay. Uh, also, we talked about the word hyperbole. And do you remember what the word hyperbole, uh, what does it reveal to us? What does that word reveal to us? What is it? Yeah. Exaggeration? Yes. An embellishment phrase, exaggerated phrase, that's exactly it. And the fact that the Bible uses that so much, um, it, it's amazing, really, the fact that Jesus taught using this. In fact, in John 21, what does it say about Jesus? He never taught without a parable. Uh, Jimmy Jividen wrote a book called Without a Parable, and it's a whole book on parables uh, from all the parables that Jesus used in the Gospels. So he used hyperbole all the time, all the way through the Sermon on the Mount, and so, so many times I think we get anxious because of what we don't understand or what we might think might happen. So turn in your psalm to number five, 753 in your psalm books. I thought you said psalm. Like, <laughs> 753. Doesn't matter what translation you have, it's 753. Um, <clears throat> Did you see in the news, uh, they talked about a, a, an attorney in Raleigh, North Carolina that is suing, of course, we live in a litigious society. There's always somebody suing somebody, isn't there? And they talked about a, an attorney in, uh, in the Carolina. He had bought this large box of expensive cigars and uh, 22 expensive cigars, it cost $15,000. And within a month, over a little over a month, he'd, he smoked all of them. And then after he had gotten the cigars, he had uh, purchased insurance on the cigars, he sued the cigar company because when he bought the fire insurance, he claimed that a a small group of small fires had destroyed those cigars. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's accurate. He smoked. Uh, but a, a small fire, a series of small fires had destroyed the cigars. And you know what the, you know what the judge came? He, he said, he was about to throw it out. He said, if that insurance company is stupid enough to insure cigars, and he gave it to them. And they had, uh, the cigar company had such a large group of lawyers, and they all, to pay. they all decided that this man was an attorney. He would keep it in the courts forever because it was just something he wanted to do, you know? So it's like and it didn't go up in smoke. It didn't go up in smoke. And so he decided, uh, they, they decided finally with all the lawyers at the cigar company they were going to pay. Wow. And so, but the thing is, after he cashed the check, the cigar company lawyers took police over to his house and they arrested him for 22 counts of arson. <laughs> so he gave the money back. <laughs> but it, you know, it's all, we live in a crazy world, don't we? When people are, are suing somebody over a box of cigars. And so I think that describes to you what kind of a world we live in today. You think things are hard today. Things in the first century were hard to deal with too. Very hard. In fact, Dr. Smalley says, uh, Gary Smalley wrote a book saying that there are three parts to anxiety. The first thing is the incident that causes anxiety. The second is thinking about the issue. And the third is letting it take over your emotions. Those are the three steps to anxiety. And. Uh, Raise your hand if you've ever been anxious about something. Okay. <laughs> Somebody had two hands up. Okay. If everybody didn't raise their hand, we need to have another lesson. That's right. If you don't need to be in this class. 
We'll offer an invitation. That's right. I'll offer an invitation. Uh, everybody experiences anxiety. Uh, turn to Philippians chapter 4, and in a moment we're going to read that after we sing this song, because Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 4. And who wouldn't have uh, opportunities to be anxious than people living in the Roman Empire? I mean, they were anxious. Uh, so let's look at the words of this song. Tempted and tried, we're oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Did you ever feel that way? Like, here I am, a good person, and here these people are, living scoundrels, living against the law, causing all kinds of problems, and they're blessed. How, how, why does that happen? David felt the same way in Psalm 100. He talked about that in, in the second part of the Psalms, uh, talking about uh, and leading with God. Why are these people, why are my enemies, why are they blessed? Why are they, you know, why are they being so well taken care of? And here I am, uh, just struggling, you know. And that's how he felt. The second one is, Faithful till death, said our loving master, a few more days to labor and wait. Toils of the road will then seem as nothing as we sweep through the beautiful gate. In our hymnody, there's a lot of theology in our hymnody. What is the writer trying to tell us in verse 2? What's he trying to tell us? It's difficult, but it's worth it. Your reward is going to be much That's better right. than your suffering. It's all going to be worth it in the end. Steve? We need to go the distance. We need to go the distance. Yeah, I've heard that before. Uh, too bad they don't have a sign like that on the Lions <laughs> practice field. We won't go there. We won't go. Oh, that's true. That's true. And the third one, when we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home in the sky, then we shall meet him in the bright mansion. We'll understand it all by and by. If we could just keep thinking about the fact that we will have all the answers. We will understand it later on. What's up. that, Tom? If you don't give up. If you don't give up. That's right. And in fact, I like, the, I like the chorus, too. Farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. I feel the, a part of the reason that I get so anxious about something is because I don't understand it or I'm worried too much about the event. And really, think about this. I, I was thinking about this last week when I had a real anxious moment. Uh, my wife called me and said my grandson was in an automobile accident. Do you know what happens when you hear that? You think the worst. In fact, I was already. I, I was going to next question: Where, which hospital is he in? You know. Um, but somebody ran through a red light, took off, whole back bumper off, and uh, so people are in accidents like that. Yeah. Steve. Oh, that, David. That's why I always tell people: when you call with news, preface it with "He's okay," yeah. but <laughs> because immediately, just like. You know, you know, as a minister, an elder, different things. Yeah. You know, if your phone rings late at night, nobody, everybody knows that we have to sign up. Please leave by 9 p.m. That means Christie's is probably in bed by 9 p.m. So, so the funny thing is, if I get a call anytime after 10, I'm, I, the first thing in my mind is, who's in the hospital or who died? I know. Yeah. It's because scary. Because nobody calls me at that unless it's an emergency. Would you have that conversation with Fran? Yeah. <laughs> Let her know. I was, I uh, was very anxious there for a few moments. You get, the, you get the message, uh, Drew was in an automobile accident, call me back. No, don't do that. <laughs> That's worse. You get just good enough information to make it better. Yeah, yeah. Well, thankfully, you just took the back bumper off and our mechanic put it on for $100. And it looks great. So, you know, worked out well. And he was, he was fine. That's a lot of duct tape for us. Hey, you can't see it. It's silver on silver. So you'll never notice it. Uh, the, the funny thing is my grandson has the same kind of sense of humor that my son has. 
And so when the police pulled up, they'd been talking to him for a while, and, and then he was over by the car, and they pulled over by his car, and he walked up to the window and uh, said to the officer, are you wondering why I pulled you over today? <laughs> he said that to the policeman. And the policeman said, I ought to give you a ticket like I gave the other guy a ticket. Thankfully, he was kidding. But uh, so the, there are things that we're anxious about that we can get anxious about. And, and there's so many issues in the world. Um, I, I like to think about the fact, Dr. Dr. Smalley said, that we don't have the kind of mental control to be able to process things in, a, in a, an orderly manner. Uh, for instance, um, you may have seen this. Any of you know who Al McGuire is? Uh, used to be a coach for Duke or somebody like Marquette that. University. Marquette. He said, the only mystery in life is why the kamikaze pilots wore helmets. <laughs> he said, I can't figure that out. Uh, we just can't figure things out unless we think of them uh, seriously and understand why. Uh, there, here's another one, and this was in the paper, not recently. It would be nice to spend billions on schools and roads, but right now that money is desperately needed for political ads. Yeah. I thought that was pretty astute, wasn't it? <laughs> be nice to have it for schools, wouldn't it? Uh, but there are things that, that we just don't do. We don't have the right kind of uh, mental control to think about things the way God wants us to think about them. Let's look at our text, Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Um, we're only going to spend 13 weeks on this text. Uh, you know, my, uh, my, my grad school professor called these pericopes. Pericopes are, uh, it's spelled pericope. It looks like pericope, but it's pericope. That's the text. And uh, we always called it pericope, and he laughed at us because it's pericope. So uh, he laughed at us the whole semester. Let's read this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord's at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Do you see where Paul's trying to get us to control our thoughts and our minds? Because if we don't, we get emotional over things. And I want you to think for a moment. I'm going to give you a few minutes. Don't shout out the answer. I want you to find in this pericope, this text, I want you to find the hyperbole that Paul is, is talking about in there. If you examine it carefully and slowly, you'll find hyperbole there. And that's what we're going to spend the lion's share of this class over the next couple of months talking about because he's trying to make a point to the Church of Christ in Philippi. And uh, it's very easy to see if you read it slowly and look for hyperbole in here. And hyperbole, again, is just uh, an embellishment phrase. Can you see an embellishment phrase or an exaggerated phrase, as Ken called it? Can anybody see it? Yeah. What is it? It surpasses all. Good, that's a good one, yeah. It surpasses all comprehension. Not some comprehension, but all. Anything else? Verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. Good, good. There's one in verse 6, too. Anybody see it? But in everything? You're close. It, it contains this word right here. Be anxious for nothing. Underline that or highlight it. Be anxious for nothing. Becky, is it possible not to be anxious about anything in life? She, she's shaking her head and right. That's correct. It's not possible. It's hyperbole. 
Do you know anybody that's never anxious? I don't. That's hyperbole. He's saying something that's impossible, in fact. Um, can you think of anybody in the Bible that was filled with anxiety? I've got a whole list in my mind, but I want you to think about it. Who in the Bible was filled with anxiety? In fact, he talks about it King Saul. several times. Saul. Yeah, describe it. Well, he had a, it's, the Bible describes it as he had an evil spirit. Yes. He allowed it to seep into his soul, didn't he? He was so anxious about things. Anybody else in the Bible? Herod. Herod. Oh, that Killed was all good. the babies. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Herod, who else? Thief on the Raise cross. your hand. Tom? Thief on the cross. Who? A thief on the cross. Thief on the cross, yeah. <clears throat> good, very good. I didn't have that one on my list. Whoops. Who else? Carrie? Peter on the Sea of Galilee. I didn't have him on my list either, Carrie. That's a good one. In fact, he started to sink, didn't he? He was filled with anxiety. He was ready to go under. Yes? Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Tell us why. Well, the uh, Garden of uh, Gethsemane. Yeah, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Exactly. We watched a, we watched, oh, I think Carrie sent it to me. The video on the Garden of Gethsemane, are you the one that sent it to me? Yeah. Oh, that was a good video. Uh, he shows the Garden of Gethsemane where the olive trees are. Did you know some of those olive trees are over 2,000 years old? Because they don't just die, they, their branches go down into the ground and they come up in another place and they come up in another place. In fact, the Church of Christ in Nazareth, uh, they have a tree, an olive tree that's over 2,000 years old. Uh, it's amazing, some of those trees in Israel that have been growing that long. So in the garden, uh, he, was, he was praying in the garden, filled with anxiety. In fact, I heard a description of the, the sweat that came out like drops of blood. There's a medical condition. I can't remember what it is. Uh, Becky, Trombosis. you're a nurse, aren't you? Uh, I don't know. I forgot. That's a real thing. Yeah, yeah it is. It's a real yeah. Yes, blood can literally come out of our... In Brad fact, Hare blood always comes out of our skin. What's that? Brad Harib in his book uh, talks about it, that he wrote the... What's the, the evidences book? Jeez. Um, That's okay. We, but he mentions yeah. it in his book. It's a, it's, it's a real condition, and it causes your flesh to become even more tender, which then the scourging would have caused even more pain. Wow, yeah. In fact... Didn't he ask God to let that cup pass from him? If it be his will. If it's your will, that's right. Yeah, I'll go through it, but please. The Greek word is thromboi, thromboi meaning clots of blood. A medical term, thromboi, B-O-I. Thromboi. Wow. Thromboi. Uh, Talk about anxiety, blood. huh? Yeah, I made a note of that in Luke. And most, most of it was anxiety. I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's... It's frightening because we, my brother-in-law passed away about two and a half weeks ago. It's frightening to see someone who knows that the end is near, but to know the minute and the hour and the means and all that for years, knowing Jesus, knowing when he's going to die, talk about anxiety. That is, that's something. In fact, some of our relatives couldn't go into the hospital room because they didn't want to be there when somebody died. Some people can't handle it. Ed? I can see uh, moments when Paul was anxious. Paul, yes. Oh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Remember he said, we were just done in to the point of death. 2 Corinthians 1. Good one. Good one, Ed. Anybody else in the Bible? I've got several that I had on my list. Yeah, Michael? Jonah. Jonah. That was one of them on my list. Jonah. He was in a whale of a belly. <laughs> I think he was in a whale of a belly, yeah. I got this all spelled wrong. You know who Jonah is. Uh, well, how, was he, how was he in have anxiety? Why was he anxious? He didn't want to go where he was told to go. He did not, yeah. In fact, the people in Nineveh probably killed some of his relatives in battle, so he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. That's anxiety, yes. 
Moses. Oh. Yeah. He didn't he didn't want to he thought he couldn't even speak to the crowd. He didn't yeah. Up. Exodus eleven, I like. He was fed up. I can't take it anymore. I can't do this. Yes, Carrie? Jacob. Jacob. Tell us where. Yes, yeah, you brought that up in Bible study this week. Jacob was so afraid of Esau, he prepared his whole caravan to meet Esau, didn't he? He was scared, literally. He sent the whole, all of his wealth in front of him and even his family in front of him. That tells you how anxious he was. David? You know, if you stop and think about it, you could really put every name in the Bible on that list. Yeah. Probably, you at one I mean? time or another. Yeah, I mean, at one time yeah. or another. But Abraham, you know what I mean? Even Abraham, you know, when he was afraid that uh, because of the beauty of his wife that they were going to kill him. And so, yeah. he, you know, comes up with a scheme. And, but, I, you know, I'd venture to say you could probably put practically everybody. On I think so. A lot of them anyway. Uh, think about um, my, the one I had, uh, I didn't put it up here yet, is Elijah. Yes. Does anybody remember why Elijah was so anxious? Jezebel. Oh, that's what I was going to bring up. Jezebel. Whew. Wow. She and Ahab were the Bonnie and Clyde of that world. They were disgusting. And, uh, you know, uh, in fact, turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. I think it's, I think it's like uh, 1 Kings 19... And I think it's in verses 1 through 3. Uh, but I think the, what I'm looking for is around verse 3. So take a look at verse 3. And uh, I, want you to, I want you to read the first three words, Tom, in verse 3. He was afraid. He was afraid. <laughs> here, here was a guy who stood up to all the prophets of Baal and Asherah and brought fire down from heaven, and then they killed all of the prophets, and then the Bible says he was afraid. Why? Because Jezebel said, you know how those prophets were that you killed? Tomorrow, you can say goodbye, Elijah. That's why he was afraid. Your life is over, Elijah. So he was, talk about being anxious. Um, can, yeah, yeah? How about David? David, yeah. David. Tell us what happened. Well, I can think of several instances in David's whole life. Yeah. One, uh, going up against a Goliath. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of it. I hadn't, didn't have that in my discussion. David and Goliath. He, uh, he could have been anxious in that situation. And you know... Think about um, after he committed adultery with Bathsheba, killed her husband, uh, Uriah, um, and then he, his child is dying, and he's on his face praying, fasting, not eating, crying, <coughs> praying, crying, praying. Uh, there's a man that was very anxious. You know, that brings up a point. Um, what things in life, in your life, have made you anxious? <coughs> Some of us have been very anxious. And uh, I'll tell you, the first time that I was anxious was uh, when Heather was, I think she was 16 or 17, she went on a double date. Man. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. When your daughter goes on the first date. When you have to keep up with her in the traffic. <laughs> You gotta run the red light sometimes, don't you? I can go forward on Sunday for that. Uh, isn't that true? Oh man! I, and then I see our, our young parents here, and I say, "Well, it won't be long before she's dating." Don't say that. They don't even want to discuss that. You know, I don't want to talk about that because those are anxious. I remember being awake. Fran and I didn't go to sleep till she got home. Uh, she was right on curfew that I remember. And then she sat on our bed in the bedroom, came in and told us the whole date. That made me feel better, but I was still anxious. Oof. What, what situations have you been through that were real anxious for you, Tom? I was sitting here in, in the middle of service and my phone rang. I didn't have it turned off, so I just muted it. 
and it was my son-in-law, and I just sent a text back, I'm, I'm at church. Ooh. And five seconds later, I get a text from him, your daughter's in a serious accident. Oh. Yeah, accident? She's in a, she's in a hospital. Wow. That must, you can't worship after that, can you? That's it. It's over. Um, hmm. I can't even imagine, you know, getting a text like that. Anybody else have an anxious moment that you recall? Yeah, Chuck? I think my anxious came uh, between the age of uh, kindergarten and a senior. And a senior? Yeah. My dad moved seven times. Whoa. Within like every three years. And, uh, and it made me wonder. Everybody moved that many times. Yeah. But as soon as he would say, uh, go pack your bags, we're, we're, we're leaving. And it was like anxiety built up because that meant I had to go and make new friends. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Oof, that's tough. I think I heard Aiden say amen. <laughs> Who did? <laughs> I think I heard my son Aiden say amen. <laughs> <laughs> I think Randy was shaking his head. Well, his dad was a preacher. They bent all over. Oh, yeah, I went to four different elementary schools. I can't even imagine that. My father was starting congregations in Chicago. He started a congregation uh, on the north side, and it was a big Catholic community. It was a huge Catholic church with about, I don't know, I'd say 10,000 members. That's the way the Catholic church organized in Chicago. Every five or six square miles, they would have the church and school. And uh, I made friends with the boys in the neighborhood yeah, we played ball together, did everything together. And then one day, uh, they started throwing rocks against the window of the church building and cursing and screaming. So they had basically, they'd been given orders to get oh. the church out of the neighborhood, the Lord's Church. And for about four months every day when I came home from school, I had to fight four or five or six of them. It was very anxious. Oh, yeah. Every day. You didn't want to go home from school, did no, you? No, my mom worked. My dad yeah. was working, of course. Sat on the fence around the house, and when I came home, I had to fight every one of them every day. And one day they were my friends, and the next day they weren't. Talk about anxiety! I can't even imagine that, Carrie. Completely forgot. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'll come back to you when What's you think of it. Have, yeah. no. You were so taken by Randy, you thought, <laughs> "Yeah, Ken." A good anxious was waiting in the basement of the church before the wedding to get married. Oh. oh remember that day? And you can remember how nervous you were, right? Very <laughs> Were you Becky? Becky was too? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. She's like, he was a knucklehead. I was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh that can be a good anxiety, good anxiousness. Actually David? What, what, what Chuck said, it kinda of made me think because he said, uh, would you say uh, you know, like you know, age one through eighteen or something? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can re I can relate to that that mindset because you know my dad was a bad alcoholic, and so for 18 years it was always anxious. You know what I mean? When it, you know what state he's gonna come in tonight? You know what I mean? Yeah. How's he gonna act? What's he gonna do? You know what kind of tomfoolery is gonna happen today? You know, and so that's so you you live with that for forever basically. Wow. Uh, my son did he was a licensed counselor, so for the government he. He counseled with a lot of families in the Detroit area. He said, Dad, if you saw some of the places these kids were raised in, you would wonder why they turned out as good as they do. Carrie? Yeah, I was going to say, um, when standing up for a presentation in school. Ooh. Oh, speech class. A speech in school. <laughs> Sherry's going, amen. Sherry's got goosebumps on her. <laughs> She's getting it right now. Oh, my. Oh, that's, tell that's, good. yeah, Ken? <laughs> no, I just say, have tell us tell about us it. About it sure. <laughs> well, it's just, uh, a bunch, in front of a bunch of strange people, and, you know, you have to talk for 15 or 20 minutes, whatever the amount of time that you have to give your speech, and it causes you to be anxious. Absolutely. Boy. I just had that conversation this afternoon with a student, because she doesn't want to get up and start yeah. to speak. Wow. Yeah. And you can feel their anxiety. It does, doesn't it? It gets easier. That's right. That's why he's telling me health care, health things, health issues. Health issues. Oof. Yeah. Amen. 
Health issues can be scary, that's for sure. Anybody else? I, I wanted to, you to explore that because there are a litany of issues that come up where we get anxious. Now, let me ask you a question. Be honest on this. How often does that actually come to fruition when we worry about something? Seldom. Seldom. Yeah. I, I found at least 90% of the time it never happens, you know? Uh, but we do have that option. God gave it to us. We can be anxious. It's not sinful to be anxious. But this is, uh, why am I saying that that phrase is hyperbole? Be anxious for nothing. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I've done it over the years. Uh, people saying, uh, they use that scripture. Be yeah. anxious for nothing. Yeah. Why are you anxious? We're not supposed to be anxious. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, really not. You know, that's right. Because, You're right. You know, my family really would get anxious about this and that and that. And you know, always anxious. Don't you hate it when somebody yeah. quotes scripture to you? <laughs> <laughs> You're wrestling with somebody and somebody quotes a scripture. Like, That's yeah, not what that means. It's not true. Yeah, when exactly. I, and mine is just I'm opening my mouth. But mine was when uh, my daughter, uh, she was in high school and uh, they went and got an open, uh, a program up in, uh, in the gym. And she fell back and hit her head. Oh. And uh, she still got that now, right? <laughs> and and uh, she called us back home and I was, uh, you know, lounging around. We don't want to hear about that. Leave that out. Don't, don't, uh, don't record that. But you got there quick. I got there. I think it was from, uh, where's that out? Wow. From Grand River and Pinko, downtown. Uh, On Grand River you drag? No, I, I, hit, I hit the lodge people. Oh. Wow. I hit the lodge. That'll do it, though. I got there. It was an early evening, so it wasn't a traffic. Wow, you were flying. I was flying. Yeah, see, and you know, when you, you get an anxious moment, uh, I've always wondered about this text because I know this text because I've preached it, I've taught it, I believe it, but this hyperbole is, is, is hard to take because I am anxious. There's no way I can never be anxious. I can just tell you right now, if it's sinful, then I sin. But he's talking about a special kind of anxiety. Tom? I think what the point he's getting to is if you're anxious, you need to get over it real quick and, and anchor yourself to the word of Christ yeah. and, and to your future salvation. And when you, when you know that you're going to be saved, that, that trumps all. Amen. 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 I, I, you know, and that's why I, had to, I came to peace with this when I realized that Paul knows that we can never, ever live a life free of anxiety. But he's talking about a special kind of anxiety. Don't you know that some people live a life filled anxiety? <clears throat> I mean, they ju they're always anxious. Uh, you'd say, isn't it a beautiful day? Well, looks like a storm's coming over there. It's not gonna be very nice very long. You know, Everything you say, is wrong because they see the worst in everything. I don't like being around people like that, do you? But some people live like it's all the time. They're anxious about something. Chuck? Well, this one, you know, you've seen this cartoon, the Smurfs. They, the one particular Smurf, <laughs> he's always saying, it'll never work. <laughs> they're they're all you know, killing themselves, getting something accomplished, and he stands there, it'll never work. Yeah, yeah. That's, but I, I've got a few friends that like to share that with me. You know what? The Seven Dwarfs, that was grumpy. The grumpy. Yeah, there's always somebody brings you down. Ed? I used to work with a couple guys that had a reputation like that, and they were known as Doom and Gloom. <laughs> they, their names were Doom and Gloom? Yeah. That's funny. Oh, I just can't be around people like That's that all the time. a lot of people have, like, OCD. Yeah. It is. 
is. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. About you know, Fran had an MRI today, and she is claustrophobic. So she had a, a Xanax, and she took it with her. Didn't take it, but man, when she started to get ready to go into that tube, whew, I, I always, you know, I, I do it on purpose, and I really shouldn't do this. <laughs> but when we go to Israel, we'll get on a plane, and I, don't don't stop the recorder for a minute. <laughs> I always I always look at Fran and say, man, there's got to be 300 people on this plane, and she says. Will you stop it? She can't take it when it's packed like that, you know, with three or 400 people on a plane for 12 hours. She's better than me. I took it. You took the Xanax. Yeah. yeah. I'm <laughs> telling you. It. <laughs> it helps, doesn't it? Oh, Probably yeah. helps. Oh, it did. Somebody has some. Okay. Yeah. Oscar gets tremendously nervous before a football game. Oh, yeah. And I'll talk to him. The way I dealt with it was I can I call it. Mm. And it helps me deal with it mentally. I tell them, that's your mind getting your body ready to play. It's mm -hmm. called adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And I said, Good. Well, get used to it. Good. But trying to help him deal with his anxiety before a football game. Exactly. That's a good way to put it. You know, that's why I wanted to discuss this tonight. Because I told you about Dr. Smalley, what he talks about. He said, there's several descriptors of anxiety. So take a look at your outline. I want you to fill in the blank here. Um, and he says that anxiety is a low-grade fear, an edginess, and free-floating sense of dread. So put the word dread in there. Do you know what dread is? It's something that builds up inside of us. In fact, I have to really, when I say prayers at night before I go to sleep, you need an outline? Oh, okay. Uh, when I lay in bed at night and I pray, if I get something on my mind, and I start thinking about it, mulling it over, and stop praying, and I start thinking about it, sometimes I have trouble going to sleep. So I have to control what I think about at night, because, you know, when... Dr. Smalley says the incident happens, then our minds think about it, then our emotions take over. You can't sleep when your heart's going 130 miles an hour. You can't sleep. So you have to, you have to cut it off and stop thinking about it before your emotions take over. Because if your emotions take over, it's too late. And so think about your anxiety and then cut it off. Stop thinking about change. Like Fran did today, before they put her in the MRI, she changed her thoughts. She started listening to music, and, and she, she can control <coughs> that. But you have to stop it when you're thinking about it, not when it takes over your emotions. So these are the effects. We don't sleep well. We don't laugh very much. We don't enjoy the weather. We don't whistle as we walk. Misfortune lurks out there. It's just a matter of time before it's going to come, and it's going to take over, and it's going to hurt us. That's what we imagine. That's what we think about. Uh, even if you've never considered yourself to be someone who struggles with anxiety, those descriptions will ring true for you because you will fall into that. Now, don't you love the Bible? Because when the Bible presents a problem, there's always an answer, mm -hmm. usually in the same text, sometimes in the next verse, sometimes two verses later. That's what I love about Paul yeah. because he tells us there's a problem and I have answers. That's why I love Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. So, if what I, what I think about anxiety, it's a meteor shower of, and I put quotes on this, what ifs. Have you ever seen somebody put air quotes on things? What ifs. We start thinking, oh, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? Our heart starts raising. What if, what if, what if, what if? And pretty soon you're out of control. Um, I like the guy who, on TV who was dating a, a girl and she decided to break up with him. He says, okay, so I'm not the cleanest guy. I'm not the wealthiest guy. I don't have a job. He kept doing air quotes. Finally, she grabbed his hands and put him down. We quit with the air quotes. Uh, but that's what, that's what we think of. We're thinking of what else. Now, on your outline, letter B. Anxiety and fear are cousins, but they're not twins. 
What do we mean by the fact that anxiety is, and fear are cousins but not twins? What does that mean? Tom? Fear, fear is usually when you, there, there's really a danger that you recognize. Yes. Anxiety is imagining one. Yep, that's right. Yeah, there's a difference there. If we allow ourselves to have anxiety and fear and let it take it over, it's going it is going to take us over. So they're, they're cousins, but they're not twins. In other words, don't let it go. Stop it. Uh, your outline, fear sees a threat. Anxiety imagines a threat or want. Anxiety imagines one. That's the difference there. And that's what anxiety does. So fear screams, get out. Anxiety ponders, what if? Fear results in fight or flight, as, uh, as Randy was talking about. Anxiety creates doom and gloom. We think fight or flight, but if you let it go on long enough, you'll think the worst, right? You'll think about all the possibilities, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And that's when we're out of control. So anxiety ponders what if. Uh, that's why fear is a pulse that pounds in our hearts like a snake in the front yard. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, at our condo in Florida, we have a snake in our yard. Um, I call him Sam. That's his name. And it drives Fran crazy because she will not go out there. She imagines that snake's going to be out there. It's not out there, but she imagines it, you know? You let your imagination take over, you're saying, he's out there, I know it. And it's not. And he's after me. And Sam's <laughs> after me, that's right. <laughs> Sam is a good snake. He's, he's a good snake. He eats things. The snake was trying to get in our Iowa parsonage, and so I reached down and I tried to pull it out as Ooh. I was trying to get into the crevice of the house, Yeah. like by the basement. When I pulled it out, I, didn't, I learned something. They have detachable tails. Oh, like that's the right. tail actually came off. And I'm sitting there and it was still it was still wiggling. <laughs> I'm holding. I said, honey, did you know the tails come off? I said, that's add it to the list of things we learned in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. I grabbed the tail of this man. He is so fast. When you let him go, he's gone. I mean they are fast. Uh, but if you sneak up behind him, they can't see him usually. But it really scares Fran. So her imagination is that snake is going to get her. She just knows it's going to happen. It's out there someplace, so we have to examine the whole yard before we go out the back door to the pool. And she worries about that. So anxiety takes our sleep. It takes our energy. It takes our well-being. Now, let's, let's think about this. Now, there's nothing wrong with anxiety. God gave it to us, didn't he? But we can allow it to take us over. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He knows that some Christians at Philippi, under the Roman Empire, have allowed fear to dominate their life. What happens when you get a Christian who's afraid? What happens when a Christian gets afraid? What happens to them? That's the, David? I think they've, you know, it's kind of like it goes hand in hand at the, the end of verse 5. There's the last Read four it. words. Read it. The Lord is near. Ah. So then to be anxious for nothing, we yeah. forget sometimes the Lord is near. That's right. Yeah, Karen? I was thinking of um, Joseph when he was going into Egypt and then he was told to come back. And oh, that's a good one. We heard Archelaus was rolling and he was anxious, but he, he was scared, but he still went because he knew that God was with him. Yeah. Moses is so afraid. I mean, Pharaoh's after his life. Then God says he's going to kill him because he didn't circumcise his son. He's got the two most powerful beings in the universe after him, Pharaoh and God. And he says, he's scared. He doesn't want to go back. And Joseph, Joseph, can you imagine the anxiety that he went through? I, I can't imagine what he went through. You know, 16 years in prison. Yeah, yeah. I feel like uh, our anxiety and our fears is uh, can can be uh, a tool of the devil if we let it. It can be, yeah. And and we have to work at not letting the devil use us to promote fear and anxiety. That's right. We can let it go so long that it does. It can be a tool of the devil. And I ask you, what happens to Christians when they are filled with anxiety? Usually. It causes Christians to become inactive. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Shut down. Shut down, that's right. We get so anxious and so afraid that we don't go to church, we don't study our Bibles, we don't pray, we, we drop out of ministries uh, because we're afraid of something or something's going to cause us to die. Uh, I, I, I remember um, there are some Christians who are so filled with anxiety, <clears throat> their Christian life ended when the pandemic hit. Yeah. It's over, you know. They allowed it to seep into every area of their life. They became inactive in a lot of ways. David, did you have a comment? Well, that's, I was just going to say, you guys always talk, hear me talk about biblical faith. And, you know, and I would say it's a threefold thing. It's that middle one. It's that trust. And I think sometimes when we become anxious, we forget, oh, we're supposed to trust. Believe we trust, trust in the Lord. That's right. You have to have the trust. Amen. If this is just knowledge, but you don't trust in what you believe, well, then you're going to be anxious about everything. And that's why it's your hand about that buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody go back there. Blake, get back there and hold his hand for a second. We're almost done. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I used to... Have you ever sung the song, Trust and Obey? Yeah. Almost everybody here has sung that song. It's my Trust son's and favorite obey. song. Boy, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. You know, I got tired of that when I was a kid. The older I get, the more I like that song. It's so true, David, what you said. Trust and obey. Wow. It really becomes real, doesn't it? The older we get. Let's bow. Yeah, go ahead. You got the last word. Okay. The first guy who was created in the only thing the Bible was Genesis. Uh huh. Adam. Yeah, Adam. Adam was anxious. Oh, yeah. He was Have God walking in the garden asking you where you're at. Yeah. And you know you've done something wrong. <laughs> Talk about anxious. Yeah. Oh, man. And well, you can't, I'm just learning about and women. you can't get out of it, right? Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for our study. We thank you for Paul's letter to the Church of Philippi and the way it uh, really causes us here at Lincoln Park to understand what they were going through and what we go through are very relevant with each other. Help us, Father, as we study this to find all the answers that Paul was releasing to the church in the first century. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Oh, bring your outline back next week. What do we get? Three lines done tonight? <laughs> okay, we'll get a little further next week. Don't be anxious. I, don't be anxious. We'll get there. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That's right. Don't worry about it. We got plenty of time. Oh yeah? You can worry about it. Don't be anxious.